Good afternoon, everyone. If I croak a little bit up here this afternoon, you'll know that I caught Mr. Tkach's bug. I wasn't sitting right down below him, but I did get to talk to him the other day, and uh, I either caught it from him or perhaps from someone else, probably someone else in all seriousness. I have a uh, little bit of a sore throat and thick head. I was telling my good friend Mr. Apartian about my thick head as I came in, and he said, a thick head? So what's new? And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I decided I'd go ahead in spite of the thick head and uh, try to serve you this afternoon because there's a far greater plague going around that is affecting many of us, I guess several of us. I met at least a half a dozen or so coming in who also said they had a cold, so I guess something like that is going around. But uh, there is a far greater plague affecting God's church, brethren, and I have been talking a little bit to Mr. Tkach and others, and he suggested again, some of you are switching back and forth, but he suggested again that I preach upon this here this afternoon. He said it is the major plague the major problem affecting God's church in the United States today, and it is very, very serious. And it is a kind of a spiritual cancer that slowly and persistently spreads throughout the body. And I think a lot of us do need to recognize and understand that kind of thing because I know that's the way it's happening and the way it's occurring in many local areas. It just sneaks up on you and all of a sudden it's there. But it must be stopped. And all of us have got to realize that each one, through prayer, through our own example, our own life, our own exhortation of our friends, and at every other means that we can possibly do, we've got to do our part to help stop this plague, because it is a genuine plague. And that is the plague of increasing broken marriages, even in the very Church of God Almighty, the very body of Jesus Christ. In a recent Dear Abby column, the Los Angeles Times, August 31st, she said, Dear readers, if you want statistics, here are some. 9,077 babies are born every day, 2,740 kids run away from home every day, 63,288 automobile accidents occur in which 129 people die, and I think that's more or less every year. But uh, at any rate, no, I guess that is every day because only 129 die. That would add up to the right number every year who, who die. And then she says 5,962 couples wed 1,986 divorce, 1,986, and of course it is a growing thing, so let's say just under 2,000 people every single day in the United States of America alone are divorcing, and of course we're finding an increasing number of God's people that are joining the ranks of those people in the United States in a country which really says, you know, in God we trust, but does not trust God and which is not carrying out what God Almighty would have them do at all. And so we need to recognize how serious that is and what we ought to do about it. In a recent Los Angeles Times column also, this from the or November the 2nd Los Angeles Times, they talk about the problem of a growing divorce and the suggestions of a man named Dr. James Ford, medical doctor, who's been counseling people about marital problems for the past 25 years. Dr. Ford says all married couples have difficulties, but the number of problems is less important than the expectation husband and wife brought to the marriage in the first place. I thought this column was rather striking. Listen to it. People who have great romantic notions about how happy their partners are going to make them may be doomed from the start, as are couples whose chief com means of communication is through sex. All they want is love and kisses and this kind of thing. People who take the cautious view that marriage is only the continuation of life by other means, expect problems and expect to cope with them. In other words, they think they know this is just going to be a continuation of life and we're going to have the same problems and the same human nature to fight, but we want to fight it together rather than fight it in loneliness without a mate. They, of course, expect to cope with those problems. And, of course, they do a lot better. Quote, if either party has the faint notion, even subconsciously, Dr. Ford says, that there is a possibility to bail out if the going gets too rough, then his or her determination to find a solution at all cost is subverted." End quote. You notice that? That's kind of striking. If they just have any idea that they can get out of it or that they might get out of it or something like that, then they do a lot oftener. Back in the earlier days of God's church, perhaps we were technically too strict on one or two areas of divorce and remarriage. We know that. We have modified that. Of course, we've come back to the middle and went to the other extreme for a while. But then people began to grab, you know, for every opportunity to get out of something that was in fact very sacred to God, and they certainly did jump from one ditch into the other ditch. 
and the other ditch was in fact far worse as far as God is concerned. Couples who start out, continuing the article here, with equal conviction that their marriage vows are irrevocable are likely to divorce, he says, and this often has little to do with the religious nature or background of the people involved. I thought that was rather interesting. Well, it ought to have everything to do with the religion involved as far as us in God's church because in the church of the living God, our religion, of course, should be and must be our life. And if our religion is our life, then we are simply going to squelch divorces in our midst. And we're going to come to the place that we have about as many as we had years ago. That is very few and very far between. As I start out here, and I want to do this very openly and very honestly, I know there are a number of people. I have no idea. I don't know all of you who've been divorced or who've been divorced and remarried. So I'm not preaching at you. I want you to know that in the beginning. I'm trying to stop future divorces because I can't help you now. It's too late for you. Maybe you did make mistakes, as we all make mistakes. Maybe you've repented of those mistakes. Maybe your partner made most of the mistakes. We all know that it takes two to tangle, however, and every one of us has a responsibility when something like this occurs. And those of us who've been in God's ministry for more than, you know, two or three decades, we know that. And we understand that there are always problems on both sides. So we learn by our mistakes. But nevertheless, we've got to learn the lesson, and we've all got to realize that every one of us has a responsibility to encourage with all of our being others not to make that same mistake, because it is a very, very serious problem. So what are our expectations? in the church of God, some of us, as we marry. That there is a way that we can get out if we can find the loose brick. Someone made a mistake some time back, and after we've been married for years, we decide that maybe they committed fornication in some time that we didn't really, some way, let's say, that we didn't talk to them carefully about, or that in some way they're not exactly what we wanted, and so we find some way, some uh, semi-legal vehicle to get out of our, our marriage. Or is our expectation that we're going to stay married until death does its part? that this is of God and that we must do that. What does God think about these ideas that go through our minds? And of course, what most important of all, what does God say? What is his mind? What does he think should be our expectation in marriage? Well, for this, I'm going to turn in the first scripture only to the Revised Standard Version, and I'd like for you to turn with me, those of you who have your Bibles at least, to Malachi, the second chapter. Malachi, chapter 2, and beginning in verse 13. I'm reading in the Revised Standard because it does make it a little bit clearer here. And I'd like to point out, as we've done, and as Mr. Armstrong has done many, many times, that Malachi was written for modern Israel. Malachi, as you know, if you look back at chapter 1, verse 1, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, and it was written after Israel's first first captivity. And, of course, it's talking about the Israelites of Christ's day and the Israelites today. It was written long after Israel went into her first captivity, warning her about future problems, And most of the book, as you read it very carefully, of course, brings you right up to the end of the world today. So it's talking to us, talking about us very much, although using ancient terminology. Verse 13, this again you do, God says to us in Malachi 2, verse 13. You cover the Lord's altar with tears and weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor at your hand. God doesn't hear our prayers the way we would like. Sometimes we're not blessed or healed or whatever as quick as we would like to have happen. You ask, why doesn't he? God answers, because the eternal was witness to the covenant between you and the wife of your youth. Notice, my brethren, marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant relationship. It's a covenant that you make with one another in the presence of the great God who gives all of us life and breath and everything that we have. The great God who numbers every hair of our head. The great God who watches over us. The great God who is trying us the great God who is testing us individually very, very much, and the great God who is now judging us because judgment is now upon the church of God and it's not going to be upon us later on. It's on us right now, as God tells us, of course, back in 1 Peter 5, with which we're familiar. Perhaps it's 1 Peter 4 there, excuse me. I'm just referring to that. All right, he says, God is witness to the covenant between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. And, of course, many men are faithless or many wives are faithless today in one way or the other though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. He repeats the word covenant. Has not God, or has not the one God, made and sustained for us the spirit of life? And what does he desire? Godly offspring. Godly offspring. We have the responsibility in a marriage to provide a stable, a steady, a dedicated, a consistent, and a faithful atmosphere for the children to grow up in. And God himself wants that. And God looks down on that as a very, very important thing in his sight. 
that we can provide in that way godly offspring, potential sons and daughters of God. So take heed to yourselves, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of his youth. God admonishes his people and us. For, and notice this powerful statement, for I hate divorce, says the Eternal. Now, my brethren, this is a powerful statement. God doesn't go around using the term hate very often throughout the Bible. You start looking and you'll see that. But God does right here. He says, I hate divorce. It's something he has a strong feeling about. He's not messing with it. He's coming out very powerfully about it and very positively about it. The mind of the great God of heaven and earth. And we've got to have the mind of God, the mind of Jesus Christ, of course, who was the literal God person who inspired the entire Bible and is speaking back here if we're going to be in God's kingdom at all. And we need to realize that because the marriage relationship, of course, pictures a great deal about, you know, being in God's kingdom, perhaps more than many of us have thought. And we've got to realize that, take that very seriously, and, of course, do everything we possibly can about it in our lives and in the lives of others. Back in Matthew, the 19th chapter, Matthew chapter 19, we find, beginning in verse 3, the Pharisees came to Christ to tempt him and said, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? He made just one man, one woman. He never intended that there be polygamy. And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This was God's plan from the beginning, that they would cleave together. And, of course, as you understand it, with the rest of the Bible magnifying it, this cleaving together has a lot more to, you know, than just living together. It involves actively, in your heart, in your mind, in your emotions, drawing together to become one person in many, many ways, to give to each other, to share with each other the hopes and the plans and the dreams and the aspirations, to put up with one another in sickness and in health, in honor and dishonor, and all the rest of it. And human beings who learn to do that with one another, to take the bad with the good, are developing a type of character lesson that they perhaps could not develop as easily or as likely in any other relationship, any other physical relationship. And that's one reason, of course, God made marriage and intended that there be marriage in the first place. So what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And they said, well, why did Moses command then to give a writing of a divorcement and put her away? But Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, we ought to put that in all caps and underlined. We're not supposed to be that today. We're supposed to be converted. We're supposed to have God's Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be different, you see, and not have the hardness of our hearts as a problem in the same way that the ancient Israelites did, because they honestly didn't have God's Holy Spirit offered them. They honestly did not know. The Sermon on the Mount was not given to them. The entire New Testament was unavailable to them, and the spiritual magnification of the law did not come to them. But it has come to us, and so we have a much higher responsibility, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. He said you won't even be there. And so we do have a much greater standard, much higher standard and greater strictness in it. So he said because of the hardness of your hearts, he permitted you. They said he commanded you. Moses said he permitted you because you were weak and sinful. So he allowed you, so to keep a sort of an order at least in your relationship, so you're just not out pouring around, as God would say, or playing the harlot in your father's house or whatever, women going around here and there, like the hippies, sleeping around. He did not want the carnal nation of ancient Israel to do that. And so to stop that type of thing, which perhaps would have been even worse, spreading venereal disease and spreading all kinds of mental and emotional problems among the children involved, as well as disease, he said at least have an orderly relationship one after the other, and make it legal before a carnal state, a carnal nation, because of the hardness of your heart. He said, I'll allow you to do that. You're hard-hearted. You're unconverted. You don't know any better. But from the beginning, it was not so. It was not God's will to do that at all. It was not so. That was never God's intention, to have people divorce. And I say unto you, whoever shall put away his wife, except it be for pornea, fornication, and shall marry another, practices adultery. Here's the one big exception clause Jesus gives. And as Mr. Armstrong has explained, he spelled that out, that that is talking about premarital sex before marriage, not adultery after marriage. And if a person comes to his mate and finds that they have played the harlot in their father's house, or a young man has been running all over here and there and everywhere, 
and the woman finds out that before or during the engagement or right in the early days of marriage, as she ought to, if she's alert, if she's trying to, if she has Christian instruction about it, she should perceive that type of thing. And ideally, the couple should talk to each other even, even before marriage, of course, as we recommend today. And at such a time, in such a situation, one mate could put the other away. And that even technically would not be a divorce, as Mr. Armstrong has explained. That would be an annulment. So, in fact, it would not be a divorce. God, knowing that fraud and knowing the person had not known about that fraud yet, would never have bound them together. So, in that case, it would perhaps technically be an annulment rather than a divorce. But anyway, uh, for for, except for fornication, and we know, of course, there's the case of absolute fraud, where the typical, I guess, uh, classic example would be like the women down here at San Pedro or up in, uh, you know, San Francisco Harbor or places where San Diego as well would marry the young men going off to fight in the Second World War and uh, the Korean War, young B-girls or prostitutes lining the bars and marrying the young 18, 19-year-old kids from Iowa, thinking they were going to be shipped off, you know, and would never see the light of day again, possibly. So they get them to marry them, you know, go up to the bar and start hugging and kissing them and get them to sign on the dotted line, and then they'd get their uh, allotment check from the government. And then, of course, when the guy shipped out a few days later, hopefully, then they'd rush right back to the same bar, pick up another, you follow me. If there's that kind of absolute fraud, provable intention where the person never intended to be a mate at all, that's another thing we have always said, because marriage is a vow, marriage is a covenant. And the other one is desertion by the unconverted mate. If the unconverted mate absolutely divert, uh, deserts the converted mate, leaves him and forsakes him, and there's no way the converted mate can save the marriage, which he should try to do, of course, and some of you perhaps have tried to do and failed, and that's not your fault if that is the case. But if the unconverted mate tried to do that, uh, or, or tried to save the marriage, and the unconverted left anyway, then God says the converted mate is to dwell at peace and is loosed from the marriage. The marriage is not bound. So uh, we know that's another exception. But again, many, many dozens and hundreds of people are getting divorced where these points are being stretched to the utmost, or frankly, people are going beyond these points and have gone way beyond these points over the last five or seven years in the liberal era in a way that should never have been. And, of course, God knows that. Mr. Armstrong knows that in some cases. And it's just simply something we have to straighten out again as God's church, the church of God, if we're going to remain the church of God so that we don't have this plague in our midst. And it must come to a halt. So he said, except for porneia, whoever marries his wife and shall marry another, practices adultery. It's present progressive. It doesn't mean the second marriage was adulterous or the married wedding ceremony or the first night together. It means that it's a continuous practicing of adultery. And whoever marries her which is put away, you see, uh, obviously erroneously or wrongly, uh, doth commit adultery or practice adultery. These are very strong statements, but they are statements from Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and we must not play them down. So it's something that Christ is trying to teach us and that we must take heed to. We must learn that marriage is a covenant, and we must learn the lesson of lasting faithfulness in that covenant. God is teaching us, brethren, that as we learn to be faithful to God himself, if we say that we intend to do that, so we've got to learn to be faithful to our mate until death does us part. We've got to learn to hang in there. We've got to learn to give and to help and to share and not to talk out on that, not to uh, poop out in Paducah, as we might say, as the Volkswagen people said their car would not do, and so on. And we've got to learn not to do those things at all. We've got to learn to build the kind of lasting relationship and lasting character that is pleasing to God because one is definitely the type of the other. Absolutely, just one is the type of the other. And uh, that physical relationship is a type of the spiritual relationship that we will have with Christ. And, of course, I'll go into that a little bit later. In Genesis, the second chapter, turn back to Genesis 2, we find God's purpose in some of this from the very beginning. In verse 18, after creating, of course, the man and the woman and all the creatures and the beautiful flowers in the Garden of Eden and putting man in it, finally God said, verse 18 of chapter 2, it is not good that the man should be alone. And brethren, I think all of us know that this does not mean that man was great and that man was powerful, that man was the, you know, shining knight sitting on his white horse. It means that man genuinely was weak in certain ways, he was incomplete in certain ways, and he needed help. Many men take this the wrong way. They say, well, God made woman to be my help, which means God made woman to be my ox or my puppy dog or my maidservant or whatever type attitude that they have about it. But, of course, the way God put it, it is not good that man should be alone, and I'll make a help suitable for him. Because man is not all there, as Mr. Armstrong has said, spiritually, unless he receives God's spirit. 
And man is not all there physically unless and until he has a mate. And that's just the way it is. And most of us understand that. So God said he would make an help fit for Adam. I'd like to point out that that term help and the root Hebrew word is similar uh, in a, many other places, but like in Psalm 22, 11, just giving you a couple of references here, such as Psalm 22 and verse 11, if you want to keep your place in Genesis, uh, I'll be back there to Genesis 2, but turning to Psalm 22, you'll notice that here it says, as uh, David cries out to God, be not far from me, for trouble is near, uh, for there is none to help. Well, this was implying the very help of God, not the help of someone weak or someone, uh, you know, inferior or something like that. The same situation uh, applies back in, uh, for instance, Psalm 46, verse 1. Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So even God himself is called a help. I want to point that out just for the men's sake. The women won't mind me doing that, I'm sure. But the word help, you see, sometimes is used for God himself. God is our help. And so a man needs help from many different sources, including God, and also including his wife. And the helper might be God in one case, and he might be your wife in another case. But that doesn't mean that she is an inferior creature. Going on in verse 19, And out of the ground the eternal God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he named them. Adam named them. And, of course, he observed them, looked at them, talked about them, and, and thought, well, what would be an appropriate name from the ready-made vocabulary God had given him? What would fit, you know, these particular creatures? Like, you know, man's uh, name meant uh, red earth or red clay, and then he saw this and named it something that meant big or powerful or this or that, probably in the original Hebrew, uh, the language at least that Adam was given. But as he looked around and became acquainted with those animals, it was very obvious that there was none of them with whom he could share very much. He could pet them, he could ride on them, but he couldn't talk to them. He couldn't commune with them. He couldn't feel at one with them. And he couldn't share with them all of his aspirations and his plans and his hopes and his dreams and go through life with them in the same way at all and have comfort and encouragement from them. He just couldn't. And he was all alone. And, of course, that's something all of us fellows, again, ought to appreciate very, very much. We take it for granted that God has made the beauty of women, not only physically, but mentally, and the responsive attitude, and emotionally, the emotions that God has given them that he's not given other men, and a man can never be happy with another man in the same way at all. There's just no way. And, uh, you know, the homosexuals apparently haven't learned that lesson, that there's just no way. A man's mind is not made to complement another man's mind, as well as the body, as well as the emotions, in the way a woman was. And we need to be very everlastingly grateful that our Creator did create woman to be our help, to be our companion to share with us on an equal plane the joys and sorrows and the triumphs and tragedies of life. That's something with which we can be very, very grateful, that thing that God did. And let's always be grateful for that. And so God then saw that need, and he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and of course took a rib out of Adam's body and made a woman and brought her to the man. It's good that we just sort of, you know, in a sense contemplate that once in a while, though. Again, a woman was not some other type creature. She was not made out of something else. She was not made separately from the man. She was made from part of the man. She was taken out of the man and eventually in marriage joined to the man once again to make that whole that God Almighty intended. And that is very beautiful when you understand it. As the beautiful poem or little saying goes about it, and I didn't bring it here, but she wasn't taken out of man's foot so he could step on her. She wasn't taken out of the top of man's head so she would be above him either. But she wasn't taken out of somewhere else, his elbow, so he could bump her or something else. She was taken out of his side, you know, right near his heart probably, so he could have his arm around her, protecting her, sharing things with her, and close to his heart, as we would say romantically, so that he could love her. And that's exactly what God Almighty, our Creator, did, and that is right, and that is true in a poetic sense, and probably in many ways, literally, God had some of those thoughts in mind, knowing that it would come to us today, and God intended that to be there. And so Adam then said, verse 23, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, and the very name for a woman, as you know, as you read your margin of the Bible, if you happen to have it here, the word is Isha, and the name for man is Ish, because she was taken out of man, out of Ish, and so her name literally means the name God gave her from Ish, from man. And we kid about woman, you know, meaning woe man. <laughs> but it's really not woe to man, it's from man. And she's to once again be joined to man, and that the two become one before God. And so this was God's intent and his purpose 
from the very, very beginning. And of course, that relationship was to be a very beautiful and a happy and a lasting relationship and never, never uh, break up. In many ways, uh, fellas, one of the ways that you ought to think about it and the way Adam obviously had to think about it for many years at least, if you again look at the very beginning and sort of focus on up here, who was Adam's best friend? Who was Adam's best friend? Who did he talk to the most? Who did he tell about the events of the day? Who did he share things with around the, you know, the campsite at night? Oh, his hunting buddies, huh? Hunting buddies? There weren't any hunting buddies. There was just Eve. <laughs> and she was his best friend. And so in many ways, a woman ought to be her husband's best friend. And of course, there will be different relationships that a man has with other men, and there will be different relationships that a woman has with other women. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that to have other friends that are very close. But as far as the depth of closeness, the constant sharing, the giving, and the communion between the two, I don't mean surface where you keep her down here and she does the dishes and you come home and you're the big gorilla, you know, and big honcho walks in. Says, okay, woman, is dinner ready? <clears throat> you know, and uh, so you talk things over at the dinner table a little bit, but not much. And then afterward, why, uh, you uh, grab a beer and head for the TV and the woman is to be in the kitchen and then you'll see her at precisely 10.15 as you go to bed. And that's it. And then the next morning you get up and go to work or she's supposed to get up and fix you something and you're pretty groggy and, you know, she's on the other side of the newspaper and that's it. And so she's there for your convenience. When you want to, uh, you know, uh, talk to her, you can grunt at her once in a while, not tell her too much. And uh, she's there to cook for you and sew for you and clean for you. And when you want someone to love, why, maybe about 10.25, well, you roll over now, you know. And she says, you know, and it doesn't work that way. Some of men learn. Doesn't work too good, does it? You haven't shared anything with her all day long. She's not your sweetheart. You haven't talked over your plans and hopes and dreams with her and made her one with you mentally, emotionally, spiritually to a degree, sharing the spiritual, the physical, spiritual things of the spirit in man, the plans, the hopes, the dreams, the beauties, the trials and tra tragedies and triumphs, as I've said, and all those things. You haven't done that. So she doesn't feel really one with you psychically in her mind and her attitude and her emotions that she shouldn't because you haven't been that way with her. This is a great problem in marriage, the problem of communication. And as I've said many times, I've had literally hundreds of women, I think I could say, tell me in counseling about marriage, my husband won't talk to me. My husband won't talk to me. I say, well, you mean, he, you know, he says hello to you when he comes in. Yeah, you know, not too much else. And uh, there's not this deep communion, this deep appreciation that this other human being, this beautiful human being who should have been beautiful to you or you shouldn't have married her in the first place is there to share your life with and to share your plans and hopes and dreams with, to make her feel that she's part of you and that you're grateful to God and grateful to her that she's there and that she left her father and her mother and her independent career that she might have had, especially in this world society, and came to be your help and came to be your friend and came to be your companion and came to be your sweetheart, and came to be the mother of your children, and came to scrub your dirty socks and underclothes and your dirty floors, and to cook for you, and to sew for you, and to make life so wonderful for you if you'll just do your part and encourage her and love her and protect her and provide for her and give yourself for her as she's giving herself for you. These are things we ought to deeply think about and appreciate before God as Christians, and we really, of course, must. Back in 1 Peter chapter 3, if you turn there with me, 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Likewise, ye wives, uh, he continues here, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word, or apart from the word, be won by the conduct of the wives. If some of you wives have unconverted husbands, you can win them best of all, not by arguing with them, but by simply showing the right example of kindness, of love, of service, and all that kind of thing while they behold your chaste conduct coupled with fear or reverence. And there is an element of reverence. I'm going to preach more to the men because I think most of the fault, or more of the fault often is with men, but not all the time. Of course, there are individual variations, great variations, and it takes two to tangle, I'll say once again. But in our society, a woman is not taught to reverence her husband. You know, he says something maybe a little too pushy, and she just throws it right back in his face right away and uh, tells him where to get off at and all this kind of thing. Whereas throughout the Bible, of course, a woman is taught to reverence her husband, and she should and she must. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair. In other words, the thing that sets her off is not to have her hair all uh, souped up, you know, with all kinds of gold strands and pearls and this and that and fancy clothes, but let it be the hidden man of the heart 
in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. This is just the exact opposite of the woman who's always talking, who's always berating, you know, her husband comes in a little later than usual. Well, it's about time you got in, George. Where have you been now? You know, right away what happens? You know, the hackles rise up. Oh, she's after me again. And he, literally, the, the, the chills or the crawl, you know, starts up in spine. You know, he he's almost involuntarily starts to double up his fists and so on if this starts. So a woman has to learn to have her tongue ruled and to have, the, as, it, as it says, the law of kindness in her tongue and to have humility, and to have the spirit of reverence, because the meek and quiet spirit is in the sight of God of great price, and especially in a wife. For after this manner in old time, the holy women also, they were like this, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. They were in subjection to them. And they said, Yes, sir, or Yes, Lord, as they might have said back at that time, or Yes, sir, as they might say today. They don't want to use the term Lord, meaning just boss or master, like we'd say yes, sir, to our boss, perhaps. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are. If you learn to have that same attitude and call your husband Lord or yes, sir, you know, as I've said, uh, uh, you know, if you can't call him because you're a little, you know, uptight, maybe your husband is bawling you out and you don't feel like calling him, you know, honey or molasses or something like that. And uh, so uh, at least you could say yes, sir. And uh, maybe you don't have one of those endearing things right on the tip of your tongue, but you could say, yes, sir, if it's a strict business situation where he, you're getting the business, so to speak, maybe in the right way once in a while, because that's his responsibility. But at least you could have that attitude, or he literally use that word. Whose daughters you do are, if you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. You're not to be afraid and terror-stricken by your husbands, and no husband should ever make his wife feel that way or have cause to feel that way. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. God tells us we've got to have the knowledge that God made woman for us, but made them to be equal with us, and they're partners with us. They've come right out, you know, in a sense, from us, in a sense, and they're totally equal, ready to be members of the glorified family and kingdom of the great God in a very few years. And some of our wives may have greater responsibilities than we do in the world tomorrow, because they may have overcome more with what they had to do with than we have, with what we have had to do with. And that's an important consideration and something that we do deeply need to recognize, that uh, wives can overcome and certainly grow, and sometimes more than the husbands, and respect that fact. You know, maybe, uh, you know, you guys might think about it. I'm not saying this is the case, but uh, treat your wife with respect. Maybe a few years from now, you'll be, she'll be your boss. You want to get on the good side of your boss while you have the opportunity. So, uh, you know, have proper humility about it. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, because she is the weaker vessel now, and certainly mainly, physically, we know that. Man is given a larger frame and more, more muscular structure than a woman. There's no two ways about it, and man is the superior in that way and intended to be by God. Man, if he will develop his mind, does have the capacity for greater creativity. And I think any honest Christian woman can understand that, that a man will have a greater you know, creativity, at least in areas outside the home. A woman can have great creativity. And what is a greater thing than bringing, bringing into being potential gods and I don't mean just the act of childbearing. I'm talking about the follow-through for four, five, six children or something like that. Potential gods where you fashion and mold their little personalities and their minds, which are often set. As the Catholic Church says, you know, give us a child until they're six years old, as you've heard Mr. Armstrong say, and we've got them. Well, that's not always true because God will intervene, of course, as we all know, and call some. But basically it is true. And who's the one that is most responsible during those years? Obviously the mother. She's with them all day long. What greater opportunity, what greater responsibility, what greater glorious calling is there than bring into being potential gods and working with their minds, their emotions, their personalities, their characters, and so on, which a wife has a greater opportunity and greater time to do. So the wife may be weaker physically. The husband may have a greater opportunity for going out and, you know, uh, building the bridges and blasting the tunnels through, uh, through uh, mountains so that he can create a civilization to protect his family and his wife and daughters and all this kind of thing, sure. But the woman is right there with him and part of him and can share in all of that and should. And is being heirs together of the grace of life. Every part of life, every blessing of life, you share it. You're heirs together with it that your prayers be not hindered. And nearly all of you married people know that if you get, you know, like this with one another, you just can't get down in the same way with joy in your heart and thank God 
and pray to God and worship God and adore God and ask God in faith and say, God, I'm doing my part and you do this and here's your wife in the next room maybe crying because you shouted at her or shoved her across the room or were rude or hateful to her in some way. You just can't do it. You can't worship God with all your heart and with joy in your heart and faith in your heart unless you're close to your mate, emotionally and mentally, as well as physically. And this is a big lesson, and all of us have got to really learn it. Finally, be you all of one mind, and this goes on to brethren in general, but, but uh, my brethren here, I want to read this to you because this is sort of a bridge section of the chapter, and these things apply very, very much to marriage, even more than perhaps other parts of the Bible might as a direct application. So he says, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, in other words, full of pity, be courteous. These are things you've got to learn in the home with your own mate. You know, maybe you're courteous to your girlfriend on your date and you opened the door and you thanked her and you for nice things or she thanked you and you were uh, gentlemanly and helped her in and out and did this and that, dressed up, were on your best behavior, but what about after you're married? Do you immediately let down and again treat her the wrong way? One thing I think all of us men and women need to think about, they say that you will tend to train your children like your parents trained you. I've read this many times, and many psychologists and teachers and so forth say that this is generally the case. There are exceptions. Well, it's the same way in marriage. You will generally react to your wife as your father reacted to your mother, and your wives will react to your husband, you know, as your mother reacted to your father. And we tend to repeat those same patterns and repeat those same problems if we're not careful. So it might be good in your own mind, in your own heart, in retrospect, in your psyche to go back and see sincerely how did your father and mother live together as best you can remember what mistakes did they make still honoring them in your heart but knowing maybe god didn't call them and how therefore are you likely to repeat those same mistakes and then fight like fury you know with god's help with his mercy with his spirit to be sure you don't repeat those mistakes and you jar yourself out of that rut and be sure you don't get right back in that same old rut repeating those same mistakes or other types of mistakes of course you come up with individually as we all do so learn to be courteous to one another. Have compassion. Who is your best friend? Should be your wife or husband, is a broad manner of speaking. Well, then who would you have the greatest compassion for when she or he is in trouble? Well, your wife or your husband. Not some guy down the road, but your own mate that God has given you. You have this automatic feeling of love and outgoing concern and want to help them and protect them and encourage them. Not just protect them physically, fellas, but protect them mentally from the bombardment of wrong ideas or encourage them when they're down and things seem too hard uh, mentally and, and emotionally and spiritually and so on. And then in a spiritual way that you, in a sense, put your arms around them and encourage them. And, of course, you can do that physically while spiritually you're praying and while spiritually you're giving them through the help of God's Spirit encouragement. And you're building them up and you're making them feel appreciated and knowing that you're with them emotionally. You have empathy and you have this compassion for your mate because you deeply appreciate the mate that God has given you and the fact that you don't have to live alone and because you deeply appreciate the great God and his purpose and because you have the attitude and the expectation and I want to keep going back to this you have drilled into your mind the attitude and the expectation that you are not under any circumstances ever going to separate from your mate and so that doesn't even come up the word divorce ought never be even be mentioned in your home or in your conversation with your mate as something that you might even be thinking about or considering. And I mean that deeply, brethren. You should never have to talk about that at all. I'm sure that there are many dozens or perhaps hundreds of us here who could say that, that it just never came up at any time, ever. But that should be your thought, where it never even pops out of your mouth. It's not something you're considering. The only consideration is that we have a problem, and how are we going to solve the problem? So we talk with each other about it deeply and openly and prayerfully. We pray about it. We work it out. And with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our being, with the help of God's Holy Spirit, we do work it out. And we do overcome. And we do save the marriage. And we do honor our God. And we do build in ourselves that everlasting faithfulness to show God that there's something there that will not quit and will keep coming back to save this situation. And that's exactly what Christ wants. Because, of course, as we'll see in a moment, the relationship of the church to Christ is the relationship of a wife to her husband. And we've got to learn the one as well as the other. And the relationship of Christ to the church is the relationship of the husband to the wife. And the husband never gives up. I mean, Christ never gives up on the church as long as the church is not running off completely and whoring. Christ never turns aside from us. The Lord will never leave us nor forsake us, it says. Never. 
And so in the same way, a husband, you see, should never give up or turn aside from his wife. I want to point out also, lest I forget it, something that I've observed, I'm sure Mr. McNair observed when he was here uh, all through the years at Big Sandy and uh, Brick and Wood, I mean, and uh, other places. All of us older students did uh, observe this and know and know that we know this, Dr. Herman Hay and so on. Through the years, Mrs. Armstrong was the best friend of Mr. Armstrong. And you could just see that as you watched the two of them together. They grew together in the way that they talked and the way almost that they looked, the same expression in, in, in the eyes and so on. And that she, in fact, was his best friend. She worked right with him. He shared everything with her. There was nothing that he kept back from her. And, uh, you know, he talked about that. And I've heard her talk about that, too. It was very obvious to anyone who was around them many, many hours. And so that, that is a good example. And we ought to understand that. Your wife can be your best friend and ought to be. Some of you may have read about King David or Solomon or other great men of the Old Testament. Solomon great at first, at least. But remember, they did not have the knowledge of the New Testament, the New Covenant, the Sermon on the Mount, and the way we do. And so God allowed them, because of the hardness of their heart, in Solomon's case, to have a hundred wives and concubines, putting them together. Did I say a hundred? I mean a thousand. <laughs> and uh, obviously he couldn't be close to them at all. And David had at least six or eight, and uh, obviously he couldn't be as close to them as he should have been either. Therefore, some of his sons rebelled directly against him, tried to stab him in the back because, you know, this wife was jealous of this other woman and her children, and it just kind of grew up where one man with one wife and that, it just, it just turns out better overall. And uh, it was God's intention in the first place. So in the New Testament, we do have the example, of course, of the apostle today uh, whose wife was his best friend. And uh, that's exactly the way it ought to be and something that we can follow as a very fine example. He goes on and says, not, re not rendering evil for evil, verse 9, or railing for railing. And remember, brethren, when you are in marriage, please don't lose your sensitivity to the feelings of another human being. Try to even pray about that. Pray about that tonight and tomorrow morning if you need to. This is a big lesson I hope that I have learned and am learning more every year of my marriage and so on. I had one, I thought, very beautiful marriage, as you know, for over 20 years until my wife died and uh, now another marriage over three years. But I know in learning and dealing even with two different wives, you have to learn the different, uh, uh, you know, the different psyches and the different reactions and try to, in that sense, get inside the head of your wife. And you wives try to get inside the head of your husband and in the right way try to, you know, perceive what makes him tick. How can you genuinely best understand him, compliment him? I don't mean flatter him, but I mean be the other half to balance him, encourage him, help him when he's down, and understand his aspirations and hopes and dreams and so on. And be sensitive to his or her needs. Be genuinely sensitive to his or her needs. And if you learn to do this, you can be so happy and it just adds so much. And the more that you learn to do this, the better. And so that if your mate does fly off the handle and say, I never liked you or I never loved you or this or that type thing, you know, which has never occurred to me, but I'm just saying I don't want to in that sense think that, but it does happen so often. Other things have been said, though. Certainly none of us have perfect marriages where we say something stronger than we met or a wife or something. You don't want to take it at face value. You want to realize that all of us are little children, grown up, and we blat out something to sometimes hurt the other person. But you ought to be strong when he's weak. And, uh, you know, then maybe he'll be strong when you're weak type of thing. And help each other. Each mate helping the other when they're down, and hopefully they're not both down at the same time. Uh, I mean, you say something you shouldn't say, then maybe they won't come back and throw it back in your face. But if they say, you are this and that way, which is awful, or I never liked you, or this or that, and then you throw that right back in their face, then what have you got? Well, you've got a boom, you know, just an explosion. A soft answer turns away wrath. And God says here, don't render evil for evil or whatever. And what do you say? Oh, you're good for nothing and you're lazy and you're, you know, well, that isn't going to help the situation at all. Your tongue is so important, so important. Learn to guard your tongue. Guard the door of your mind, in fact, so those thoughts don't even get in there. Don't let them get started too far in that direction. But guard your tongue, not rendering railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing. If you say, well, I'm sorry, honey, I, you know, I've helped some and I can do better. And I, I'm sure I did make a mistake. And you're tired and I can see that and you have a headache. And now you have these three little children here and you're probably all worn out. Here, let me help you. Well, then all of a sudden she'll probably start, woohoo, you know, <laughs> and fall into your arms and start kissing you. And, and, and it'll all be over just like that because you showed concern and love. 
but she's bristling. And if you come right back at her and want to fight, she'll give you a fight, chances are. If you want to go looking for some fight, why, uh, you know, go see somebody else, but don't see your wife. You've got to, you've got to live with her the rest of your natural life. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile and how important that is in marriage. So please remember those principles. They're so important and, of course, so beautiful in so many ways. Another thing that I hope we can all learn, the lesson of 1 Corinthians 7. Mr. Armstrong covered this in the study last night, but perhaps didn't well uh, in coming down with my cold and eating less and trying to fight it. I did not come here to hear it, but I, I want to give you this scripture. Many of you were not here either, I'm sure. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, God says back here in verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent, for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and be together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And God tells husbands and wives that they each belong to the other. Your body belongs to your mate, and his or her body belongs to you. And that ought to have been understood when you were married. And so I say, not only physically, but emotionally and psychologically, never, <clears throat> and I mean never, use sex as a weapon. And all of you married people and all of you who are about married can understand that. Nothing mysterious about it, nothing sexy about it either. It's just that when you're married, you are one and should be beautifully one before God. And you must never, ever use sex as a weapon. It just is not right. And you are violating God and God's instruction and God's command because God commands you not to do that. He says, defraud ye not one the other in this way. And read the previous verses and you can tell that's what he's talking about. And yet so many times, of course, people do that without realizing it. And they use the very thing that ought to draw them together. They use the very thing that ought to be used, on some cases at least, as a healer to make them want to come together, to be happy, to forgive each other, and use that as the great divider. You know, and how pitiful that is. So you've got to learn, of course, the lesson of how to use that gift of God in a right way as well, because it's very important. Now, back in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, Ephesians 6 and verse 12, I want you to notice one other uh, scripture here that's a special point. Ephesians 6, verse 12, because this has a great deal to do with marriage, and I'm sure that it has to do with marriage in God's church more than any other marriages by far on the face of the earth. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Paul writes here, Ephesians 6, 12, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits, as it ought to be translated, in high places. And brethren, if wicked spirits in high places are trying to get into God's church and divide us and overthrow us and discourage us and tear us apart, what is one of the main institutions they would go after? Well, obviously marriage. They would try to separate us. They would try to divide us from our mates. And if our marriages are unhappy, then the people in God's church are unhappy. If our marriages are unhappy, our spiritual lives are going to be unhappy, and we can't even pray as we ought. And so this veritable plague is beginning to spread itself across the land. And we've got to be sure that it has not come near our door. And we've also got to be sure, as I, I do want all of you who are having happy marriages, and I know probably that is the majority, but please don't just take it as meaning someone else. You try through prayer, through encouragement, through every means that you can by having them over, by being perceptive of their needs to help your friends here in this church and this local, lo local church area to be sure that their marriages do not fall apart and that we can build not only reasonably happy marriages, but we can build some of the happiest and the most long-lasting marriages in the whole United States of America, which we ought to do because we're the very church of God. We're the very bride that's going to marry Christ and be faithful to him forever and ever and ever and as long as the sun shall shine. So how long should we be married to our physical mate, building that same kind of character in our marriage? Well, obviously, as long as we're in this flesh, as long as the two shall live, they are to remain married. And that's beautiful, but that is very, very important, of course, because it is such a great spiritual lesson. Now, back in chapter 5, Ephesians 5 now, And beginning in verse 21, <clears throat> I want to go to verse 21 before the normal starting place, uh, which is 22, for this reason. It's talking to all Christians here, but this aspect must be remembered in marriage as well, because your closest neighbor is your wife. God says, you know, the golden rule, do unto your neighbor as you would have him do unto you. 
to love your neighbor as yourself. The first and great commandment is to love God with all of your being and worship him and adore him and obey him. And the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Your closest neighbor, obviously, is your mate, your very closest neighbor. So who are you going to love most of all and concentrate upon first of all? Well, the old saying, charity begins at home, is certainly true because you don't have the stability and the faith and the right kind of confidence and the outflowing love coming out from yourself and from your family and so on, you know, unless you have that at home, do you? You just can't give it and share it. It's not there. And it's harder to give it. Some have had to give it anyway. Some of our ministers have had problems where maybe their mate left the church and them and everything else. And maybe there was hell on earth for a while, but they've had to try to give it anyway. And some of you wives have had husbands who've deserted you or had some of these things where it was not mainly your fault. I know that. But ideally, you'll have more love and more chance to serve others if you have that strength in yourselves and in your marriage and coming right out of your home. So God says here, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. All of us have got to submit to one another. Any of us who are ministers have got to submit to the lowest deacon in the church when it comes to direction of parking or this or that, or a member, if he knows more than we do. If we're in conversation with some member in the church, and, uh, you know, years ago I think that the ministerial badge was overused. We don't need to go back and beat that old dead cow over and over again, and I don't mean to, but, you know, often we had 22, 24 young minister, year old young ministers going out. And they knew everything about everything. I mean, you know, if you asked in order to know about what kind of suit to buy or what kind of car to buy or this or that, well, they knew all about it. Just ask them. But, of course, there are older men in the church, 45, 55, 73, or whatever, that have been out in the world for years. And they know more about those things, so you submit yourself to them. Someone's asking a question. You may not pass it on as the official doctrine of the church, but if you're in conversation with a group of men and you, the minister, are sort of leading it, and here's some guy, he knows a lot more about some aspect of, of uh, life than you do, was, you know, sort of defer the conversation to him. Well, Mr. Jones or Smith, whatever he is, uh, you know, this is your job. You could tell us what do you think the answer to this would be and uh, submit to him. And how much more should you submit to your own wife at times, you husbands? Your wife might know more than you once in a while. I mean, it could really happen. <laughs> you know, it could really happen. And in that case, you'd have to say, well, honey, uh, that's right. I can see you're correct. You've read this more recently or you know more about this than I do. And respect that. And sometimes, you know, she might gently correct you. I don't mean that she means to act like the big cheese, but say, well, honey, you're a little rough there. Or, or you know, with the children, you're a little rough. You know, you slammed the door and broke all the glass. I, I know you're strong, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, Mrs. Mrs. Snyder, you know, at the end of a hard day, she might say, well, Harry, I know you're doing all these things, but please don't, you know, rip the door off the hinges every time you come in, you know, and uh, you'd say, okay, honey, you got a good point there, type thing, see? And uh, so submit one to another in the fear of God, because you know that God has given your mate all kinds of uh, perceptions and abilities and uh, areas of intelligence that are beyond yours, or you men should know that, because your wife may have several areas of intelligence beyond yours, not just one, and I mean that very deeply. And it's all, all good for all of us men to realize that maybe I should make another statement. I've said this in class, I don't want to shock you men, but I dare say, I'm not trying to put anyone down and all the dignitaries here, but I dare say that there are women in this world today who have more all-around mental ability than any of us in this room any of us in this room. And we might think about that. I'll talk to Jack Kester, who's quite brilliant and got the highest score on various things later, and Mr. Uh, 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 LaRavia and Mr. Doc Kester and, uh, uh, you know, many others here, Mr. McNair. But I dare say there are some women on earth that have more all-around ability uh, and just in mental ability. They may not in emotional, they may not have in the knowledge of God, but uh, or in, in most areas, you know, that they could maybe do better in math and science and history and this and that. Then, uh, but that would be the exception. That would not be the rule. Such a woman ought to marry a very outstanding man, you know, obviously, to, so that they would be well-mated. But there are women who are very outstanding. That's what I mean to say. And we, uh, Shirley Huffstetler, I think, was the one who gave the good opinion, you know, for us in the state appeals court, and then later was made the secretary of, uh, of education here, the first secretary of education. Well, I've read some articles about her, and I think Mrs. Huffstetler was pro probably, uh, it was and is, a very outstanding woman and probably more all-around educated and intelligent than at least most of us. Uh, we won't have Mr. Kessler admit that she's better than him in law, I don't know, but she's more experienced, probably she's older. And uh, so, uh, anyway, I'm partly kidding there. But you see what I mean. 
just very intelligent. As you read about her, she's had a very broad background. And many other women of that sort that you might, you know, realize, such as uh, Golda Meir, the prime minister of, of Israel, the fighting lady type thing, and uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, the Iron Maiden, as they called her over in Britain, a very capable woman. And putting Britain back on, you know, a little more conservative track for a while, maybe too, too strict for a while. There are some troubles, of course, but still, all in all, doing a very good job. So we need to respect one another. That's my point. Deeply respect our wives as well as our husbands. And all of us submit to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, brethren and wives, please understand that this does mean exactly what it says. It does not mean something else. It says a wife should honestly, sincerely submit to her husband as unto the Lord Jesus Christ is what it's talking about. If you would submit to Christ, and if you're going to be in Christ's kingdom someday, then you should submit to your husband as unto Christ, as long as it's not in direct contradiction. We know that scripture, obey God rather than man, you know, Acts 5.29. Okay, if your husband tells you to directly kill someone or do something wrong, then you don't do that, and you suffer the consequences. But otherwise, you do obey your husband. If more wives would do that more quickly, and some, uh, you know, newly married ha- uh, macho guy comes in, and his wife says something he doesn't like, and he says, well, I just wish you'd go jump in the lake. And she quietly disappears, you know, and comes back through the room about three or four minutes later in her bathing suit and the car key. He says, where are you going? He says, well, honey, you said go jump in the lake, and I, I want to do what you say. And she's just, you know, he'd probably say, well, now, wait a minute. Let's just sit down and think about this for a while. And he'd probably be more careful what he said I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but he'd probably be more careful of what he said if his wife had that quick obedience, that responsiveness. There just wouldn't be anyone to fight with. Do you follow me? There honestly, ladies, there just wouldn't be any fight there. There wasn't anyone to fight with. And the guy just gives up and he thinks, well, she's on my side. I better fight somebody else. You know, Uh, there's this guy down the street I don't like, say, whatever. Pick on him a while. Anyway, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord, but it does mean that, all joking aside. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And the analogy there, that great spiritual analogy of all of us submitting ourselves, loving and obeying and fearing and reverencing and worshiping Jesus Christ, our Savior, who poured out himself for us in death, who in the first place made us and created us, as God created all things by Jesus Christ and is now our high priest, our Lord and Master, our coming King, sitting in blazing glory at God's right hand as we love and adore and worship Him and submit ourselves to Him, hopefully with all of our hearts most of the time, and we're not perfect in it, any of us, but as we try to do that and think about that relationship, how much more then should wives think, well, that's right, this is what this is talking about. I want to really show that same Christ I'm on my husband's team and I'm going to submit myself to Him and I'm going to do everything I can to save our marriage and honor my God and do what he says in his word and not listen to all this garbage that's going around all over the world today. The feminist type of thing, the the homosexual type of thing, the unisex movement, all the rest of it, you know it, it's just bombarding our minds. It's bombarding the minds of you ladies, it's bombarding the minds of you men. And all of us have that coming at us. We've constantly got to go back to this word and meditate on it and drink in of it and chew it and digest it and make it part of ourselves. And then we can save her marriage and be right back at the root of what it's all talking about. And then husbands have got to know their part and really believe it and do it too. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Love is an outgoing and outflowing concern, as Mr. Armstrong has explained so much. And if a man has that outflowing concern and he's thinking daily, how can I make my wife's life happier? How can I serve her? How can I enrich the life of this beautiful human being that God has given with me to share life? And even ask her about it sometimes. Literally, man, say, honey, how can I make your life happier? Could I take you more places? Could we take more trips? And be open to her, too. I mean, do it in an open, loving, and receptive atmosphere. And sincerely try to do it in every way you can to make her life happier and fuller and serve her. And serve her not only now, but for the kingdom of God. Love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I have a, another uh, clipping here, again, from the Los Angeles Times. I'll read just part of this, but it's drawn from Eric Fromm's The Art of Loving, his book. And he's a psychologist, psychiatrist, and we don't go along with all that they teach. But this is all right, very beautiful. And he's describing the attitude of love and marriage. 
In the ge most general sense, love can be described as giving rather than receiving. The giver experiences himself as being overflowing, spending, alive, joyous. Giving is more joyous than receiving, not because giving is a kind of deprivation, but because being able to give makes us aware of our own aliveness. Being able to bring pleasure to another human being makes us feel powerful. The most important kind of giving involves giving of ourselves, giving of the most precious stuff we have. This doesn't necessarily mean that one person sacrifices his life for the other. One person gives the other all the things that are alive in him. He shares all of his joys, his interests, his knowledge, his understanding, his humor, and his sadness. But in giving, he cannot help bringing something to the life of the other person. And whatever is brought to life reflects back to the giver. So giving implies making the other person a giver too. Love produces love. Very beautifully put. Very beautifully and perceptively put. And would to God that all of us would try to practice that in our marriage more than any other single place. Because more than any other single place, more than any other single institution in the human flesh, the institution of marriage is the place where one can most perfectly and consistently practice this attitude of, you know, it's more blessed to give than to receive and constantly give to the other one who is in fact part of ourselves and learn that lesson. Learn the lesson of patience when someone is sick. Learn the lesson of patience when someone is out of sorts with you. Learn the lesson of forgiveness. Learn the lesson of humility. Learn the lesson of serving and even doing little dirty jobs when your wife is sick and she can't do it all and you have to for her, fellas. And all the rest of it, giving and serving and loving and outflowing concern. And it reflects that back on the giver and makes us all happy in the end and blessed before God. So Christ gave himself for the church, verse 26 now, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water but the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blemish. And so Christ wants the church to be beautiful and healthy, so to speak, and perfect, and so should the wife, his husband, uh, the husband, his wife, but not in a demanding way, like I'm perfect and I'm going to give this to you, but in humility, realizing his own problems, but to want to help his wife physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually to have a better life and to serve her. As Mr. Armstrong has said so many times also, he always used to present his wife to him, and I'm sure still does, in the best possible light. In other words, he would present in his own thoughts his wife to him as beautiful, as right, as his help, his companion, present the good qualities as he thought about his wife to himself. Do you see what I mean? Not dwell on her bad qualities, not dwell on her mistakes, because every human being does have some bad qualities. Every human being does make some mistakes, except Christ only. But we don't dwell on those. We present our wives to ourselves in the best possible light and try to appreciate them and cherish them until death does his part. Verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And so men ought to think of that. She's part of me. And as I say again, I would like to add this. Be perceptive of your own mate's needs at all times. If your husband sense that your wife is down, maybe she just had something go wrong, maybe even a serious thing such as a miscarriage, you have to sort of again grit right inside of her head if you can. You know, project yourself if you were a young wife and maybe she hasn't had a child yet and the very first child or chance to bring into being a little baby and all the physiological and emotional changes start taking place in your wife's body as she grows and expands and starts to blossom and carrying this baby and all of a sudden, bang, it's gone. Can you get right inside of her head and encourage her, help her, cherish her, comfort her and this type of thing? You see what I mean? How to serve one another in all those ways. You wives, your husband has some tragedy. He breaks his leg and has terrible time or loses his job and has to go get another job. Maybe it's Sabbath keeping. Maybe it's something else, but he's down for a while. He feels impotent. He's not able to provide for the family. What's wrong? And you've got to encourage him in the right way. If he did something wrong, don't encourage him that, but show him you're with him. Show him you know he has good qualities. Show him you know he can make a comeback. He can do better and that you're with him and you're supporting him in every way. These are ways we can learn to love one another and to build our marriages and to become truly one flesh. For this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So it all points there. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Brethren, we've got to realize that marriage is something that pictures and builds the kind of character that God wants forever. 
He wants us to build ourselves a lasting relationship in our marriages. He wants us to learn faithfulness to a covenant so that he can know, as we do that, that we will transfer that same lesson of character to being faithful to Christ and faithful to him throughout all eternity. Our apostle, Mr. Armstrong, has set the example. He was faithful to his wife. They lived a fine married life for 50 solid years, half a century. So again, we have that example. We have the example of many other fine men in God's church, God's servants among us. I just happen to notice I'm not trying to pick on anyone in particular here or leave anyone out. But as I came in the anteroom today, I saw Mr. Carlton Green, or really outside, as I was coming along. And of course, he and his wife, in a very special way, which some of you understand, just recently celebrated their 25th anniversary. And then I sat behind, happened to sit right behind Dr. Kessler. And I know that Jack is not, I mean, you know, he has a halo, but I know he's not, you know, uh,